Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Father in heaven, uh, today we're going to study some very solemn and important things. And we need desperately the help of your Holy Spirit. And so we ask that as we open your Holy Word, that your Spirit will hover over its pages and come into our minds and hearts so that we might be able to comprehend the importance of what we're going to study. And we thank you, Father, for hearing and answering our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Most pagan religions are characterized by a belief that there are in existence many gods. This concept is known as polytheism. In contrast to ancient pagan religions, we have Judaism, which at least after the Babylonian captivity taught a staunch monotheism. Now this doesn't mean that before the Babylonian captivity in the Bible you didn't have uh, a staunch monotheism. What I'm saying that in actual practice before the Babylonian captivity Israel fell repeatedly into idolatry. Obviously the Bible teaches monotheism from the times of Moses on. Now when Christianity was born Christians had a very difficult task of explaining how Jesus was God and how the Father was also God and still preserve monotheism. The problem became even more complicated when uh, Christians began teaching that the Holy Spirit is God as well. Of course the obvious question is if the Father is God and the Son is God and the Holy Spirit is God do we not then have three gods? Do we not have polytheism, the idea that there is more than one God or multiple gods? Is this not blasphemy? Is this not paganism in the highest sense of the word? Now this is a problem that the early church had to struggle with. And as a result of the struggle many heretical movements arose within the Christian church to try and explain how there could be three persons and yet preserve monotheism, the idea that there was only one God. One group of heretics known as the Ebionites taught that Jesus was born a normal human being. But he was such an extraordinary human being in his life that at the moment of his baptism he was adopted into the Godhead. In other words, he was a man who became God. In other words, he was adopted as a member of the Godhead. Obviously, this makes Jesus a semi-God, and he is not inherently God within his very own nature, which creates more problems than it actually solves. Then you have the heresy known as modelism, or Sabellianism, named after Sabellius. He taught that actually God is one person who manifests himself in three different forms or modes. It was common for example for those who taught this heresy to say that in the Old Testament uh, God manifested himself as the Father. In the Gospels he manifested himself as the Son. And in the church age he manifested himself as the Holy Spirit. In other words, one person at different periods of human history took different forms. But you don't have three persons, you have one person in three different manifestations of human history. Of course this creates huge problems as well, as we'll notice as we study the concept of the Trinity in Scripture. Another heresy which crept into the church when this idea of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being God is known as Arianism. It's named after Arius. And this is the idea that Jesus was the first creature made by God, made by the Father. In other words, Jesus is a created being. By the way, the heirs of this idea today are the Jehovah's Witnesses. They believe that Jesus was the first creature of the Father 
and his name was Michael the archangel. That is to say they don't believe that Jesus is eternal God in the fullest sense of the word. They teach that Jesus was a God, but of course this creates more problems than it solves because then you have a great God and you have a lesser God. You still end up with polytheism. Now Muslims and Jews today are staunchly monotheistic religions. In other words they staunchly stand for the idea that God is one. There is only one true God. Now Christianity agrees with the idea of monotheism, but Christianity has a different understanding of the idea that God is one. In other words Christianity does not view the oneness of God in the same way that the Jews and the Muslims do, because the Jews and the Muslims believe that God is one person. That's their monotheism. But scripture teaches that God is one and yet that one God is composed of three persons. Now I'd like to ask the question, isn't it logical nonsense to say that there are three persons but only one God? How can three be equal to one? In fact the title of our study today is one plus one plus one equals one. Now you say, Pastor Bohr you have to go back to grammar school because one plus one plus one does not equal one. How can you say that three is equal to one? We're going to study that concept in scripture today. Sadly even within the Seventh-day Adventist church today there are many who are coming to the conclusion that the doctrine of the Trinity that has been held by the Seventh-day Adventist church for many decades actually is of pagan origin. And many are saying that this doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist Church should be abandoned and that we should adopt the view basically that the Muslims and the Jews have that there is only one person in God. Now what I would like to do in our study today is go through three very simple steps to study the biblical concept of God or the biblical concept of the Trinity. The first point that I would like to cover is those texts of scripture that speak about God as one. There are many texts in scripture that refer to God as one. The second step that I want to take is to read the text where God is spoken of as being more than one. In other words a plurality of persons within the Godhead. And in the third place what I want to do is relate these two ideas that God is one and God is more than one so that we can understand in what sense according to the Bible God is one. Let's begin our study and we're going to use scripture abundantly in our study today. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. This uh, text is the central confession of the faith of Judaism you will hear it used in every Jewish synagogue even till this day. It says there in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4, Hear O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The word Lord is capitalized so it's Jehovah. Jehovah or Yahweh is one. Very clearly in this text God is spoken of as one. Jehovah or Yahweh is spoken of as one. Notice Isaiah chapter 44 and we'll read verse 6 and we'll also go to verse 8. Once again we're emphasizing the oneness of God. It says in Isaiah 44 and verse 6, Thus says the Lord, once again capitalized, the King of Israel and His Redeemer the Lord of hosts. By the way I don't know if you noticed here that we have two Lords at the beginning of verse 8, of verse 6 rather. Did you notice this? Thus says the Lord, capitalized, the King of Israel and His Redeemer the Lord of hosts. So there are actually two Lords. There are actually two Yahweh's or two Jehovah's. What does He say? I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is what? No God. Verse 8, Do not fear nor be afraid. 
Have I not told you from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. By the way this is a central verse that the Jehovah's Witnesses use to call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses. You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Indeed there is no other rock. I know not one. So according to these verses how many is God? God is one. And yet we notice at the beginning of verse uh, 6 that there are two Yahweh's, there are two Lords here capitalized, or Jehovah as it's stated in the King James Version. Notice Isaiah chapter 45 and verses 21 and 22. Once again the idea of the oneness of God. God is one. It says there in Isaiah 45 verse 21, Tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. It's speaking about the false gods of the nations. Who has declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a just God and a Savior. There is none besides me. Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Several times in these verses, verses 21 and 22, you have the emphasis that God is one, there is none besides Him, there is no other God. Now the emphasis that Isaiah is giving in chapters 44 and 45 is not necessarily saying that God is numerically one, what is being contrasted here is God as the true God with all of the false gods of the pagan nations. That's why God is saying none of those gods are the true God, I am the true God, I am the only God. Let's go to the New Testament now, Mark chapter 12 and verse 29 and then we'll jump down to verse 32. Mark chapter 12 and verse 29 and then we'll go to verse 32. A lawyer comes to Jesus and asks him a question. It says there, Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the greatest commandment, or the first commandment of all? And then of course Jesus quoted Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 with which we began our study. The Lord our God is one Lord. There's only one true God. Then notice verse 32. He speaks about the answer that Jesus gave to his question. So the scribe said to him, Well said teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God and there is no other but He. Let me ask you, does the New Testament emphasize just like the Old Testament that there is only one God and there is no other? Absolutely. It's not only a concept that the Jews had, it is a Christian concept which is found in the New Testament. Notice also John chapter 10 and verse 30. John chapter 10 and verse 30. Here Jesus is speaking about His relationship with His Father and this is one of the shorter verses that we find in the Bible. Jesus says this, I and my Father are what? Are one. Notice the emphasis once again on the oneness of God. There's the Father and there's Jesus, but the Bible says that they are one. Now notice let's, one more verse that speaks about the oneness of God and then we're going to examine the verses where God is spoken of as being more than one. John chapter 14 and verses 10 and 11. John chapter 14 and verses 10 and 11. Here Jesus is speaking and He says this, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in Me? The words that I speak to you I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Notice the Father dwells in Jesus. Notice verse 11. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Jesus gives the impression in these verses that He and the Father 
are to be identified. He says, the Father in me, I in the Father, give the impression that they are not two, but they are really what? They are really one. So in the New Testament we have this concept that God is one, and yet you have the idea of the Father and Jesus being separate and distinct individuals. Now how in the world can you understand this? You know, Jesus saying that God is one, but at the same time speaking about Himself and about His Father. The fact is that we have several texts in the Bible that refer to a plurality of persons within God. In other words there's more than one person in the Godhead. Now we've examined already the texts that speak about the oneness of God, at least some of them. Now what I want to do is refer to some texts that refer, that speak about the plurality of persons within the Godhead. You see God is one, but there are more persons than one. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. Very interesting verse, it's speaking about the creation of man, the plan to create man. It says there, then God said, by the way the word God there is Elohim, it's plural, it can be translated gods. Then God said, now notice this, let us make God in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Do you notice the pronouns here? God said let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Very clearly you have an idea of a plurality of persons within God in this verse. Notice Genesis chapter 11 and verse 7. Genesis chapter 11 and verse 7. This is the episode at the Tower of Babel. And uh, God is in heaven, He's watching what the builders of the Tower of Babel are doing, and notice what He says, Come, let us go down, and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. Once again, let us go down. And if you read on in chapter 11, it says God confused there at Babel their language. So it was God who confused the languages of the people, but at the same time we find that God says let us go down and confuse the languages. So once again you have the idea that even though God is one, you have more than one person within the Godhead. Notice Genesis chapter 3 and verse 22. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 22. There are several references in Genesis that speak about this phenomenon of God being one, but there being more than one person in the Godhead. This is after Adam and Eve sinned, and God sees it necessary to cast them out of the Garden of Eden. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of what? One of us. Once again, man has become like one of us. The devil said, You shall be like who? you shall be like God. Now they weren't like God in every way, they were like God in the sense that now they knew good and evil, because God already knew evil, because it had originated in heaven before the creation of this world. But interestingly enough, uh, God says, behold the man has become like one of us, in a specific sense, to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life, and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord that's the word Yahweh or Jehovah, God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. Once again the pronoun us is used to refer uh, to man in the Garden of Eden, or immediately after he was cast out of the Garden of Eden. Indicating that even though God is one, there's a plurality of persons within the Godhead. Let's examine several other verses in the Old Testament to this idea of the plurality of persons within God. Isaiah 6 and verse 3 speaks about the call of the prophet Isaiah. And even though the idea of the Trinity does not come through real clearly here, there's a hint that you have three persons within the Godhead. You say, how is that? Well Isaiah 6 and verse 3 is speaking about the hymn being sung by the, by the seraphim, the six-winged creatures. 
And it says there in Isaiah 6 verse 3, And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy. How many times? Three times. Is the Lord. The word Lord there is capitalized once again. The Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Is it just perhaps true that the reason why you have three holies here is because you have three persons that are receiving the honor and glory and praise of the seraphim. Notice Isaiah 61 and verse 1. Here it comes out even more clearly. Isaiah 61 and verse 1. I want you to see in this verse that you have three persons. By the way this is the verse with which Jesus began His ministry in Nazareth. You can find it in Luke chapter 4. The Spirit, there you have one, of the Lord God, there you have two, is upon me. Did you catch that? Once again, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, and this is a messianic prophecy, because the Lord has anointed me, see the distinction between Lord and me, the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. So you have three individuals here, the Spirit, the Lord God, and me, which is referring to the Messiah. Notice Isaiah 48 and verse 16, Isaiah 48 and verse 16. I hear God is speaking, He says, come near to me, hear this, I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was, I was there. And now listen to this, and now the Lord God, there's one, and His Spirit, two, have sent me, three. Once again the idea of three within the Godhead. Notice also Isaiah 63 and verses 9 and 10. Isaiah 63 verses 9 and 10. Here you have three individuals, but uh, the Messiah is spoken of with a different name. Notice Isaiah 63 verses 9 and 10. It's speaking about Israel, and God is speaking here. In all their affliction, or it's being spoken about God rather, in all their affliction, He was afflicted. There's one. He was afflicted, and the angel of His presence saved them. See, God is afflicted, then it says the angel of His presence saved them. Let's continue reading. In His love and in His pity He redeemed them, and He bore them and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved whom? His Holy Spirit. So he turned himself against them as an enemy, and he fought against them. Do you see the three in those two verses? You have first of all, he was afflicted. Secondly, you have the angel of his presence saved them. And then later on in verse 10, but they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So you have the Lord, you have the angel of his presence, and you have the grieving of the Holy Spirit. Once again, the idea of three persons very clearly expressed in these two verses of Isaiah 63. I wish we had time to talk a little bit more about the angel of His presence. In the Old Testament the angel of His presence is also spoken of as the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord very frequently in the Old Testament is spoken of as being God. The angel for example that delivered uh, the three friends of Daniel from the fiery furnace Nebuchadnezzar said that his appearance was like the Son of God. At the burning bush, the angel of the Lord appeared in the bush, and then he speaks and he says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The angel is speaking this. You know, Jacob struggles with the angel in Genesis 32. And uh, you know, he says finally, I have struggled with men and with God, and I've seen God face to face. And that's why he calls that place Peniel. And yet he was struggling with the angel of the Lord. In other words, the angel of His presence is God, according to Scripture. Now let's go to several texts from the New Testament that show us this idea of three persons within the Godhead. Matthew chapter 3 and verses 16 and 17. 
Matthew chapter 3 and verses 16 and 17. This is at the moment of the baptism of Jesus. And I want you to notice the three once again. When He had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, there you have one, and behold the heavens were opened to Him, and He saw what? The Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon Him, and suddenly a voice came from heaven, whose voice was that? The Father's, because He says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. How many do you have at the baptism of Jesus? Three. You have Jesus who is being baptized, you have the Spirit that is descending upon Him, and you have the voice of the Father from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son. Notice John chapter 14 and verse 16. John chapter 14 and verse 16. Here Jesus is speaking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Notice once again the idea of three. And I, this is Jesus, will pray the Father, there you have number two, and He will give you another helper. Who is that other helper? The Holy Spirit, right? That He may abide with you forever. Once again, John 14 verse 16 has three. I, the Father, and the Helper who is the Holy Spirit. By the way, when Jesus used the word other, in Greek there are two words that are translated other. One is the word eteros. We get the word heterosexual from that. Heterosexual means of a different what? Of, a, of the same sex but of a different kind, right? And the word that is used here in uh, John 14 verse 16 is not heteros, in other words of a different kind, another of a different kind, the word is alos which means another of the same kind. So when he says I'm going to send you another counselor, he's saying I'm going to send you another counselor just like me. Notice John chapter 15 and verse 26, John 15 and verse 26, once again the same idea of threeness. But when the Helper comes, there's number one, whom I shall send you from the Father, there's number two, the Spirit of Truth, there's number three, who proceeds from the Father, He will testify of what? Of me. Once again, you have the Helper, you have the Father, and you have me. The idea of three coming clearly through in the New Testament. Notice Galatians chapter 4 and verse 6. We'll notice several more from the New Testament. Galatians 4 and verse 6. It says there, and because you are sons, God, there's one, has sent forth the Spirit, there's two, of His Son, there is three, into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. So you have God sending the Spirit of His Son, three once again. Matthew 28 and verse 19, Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, this is the great commission that Jesus gives to His disciples, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. By the way, how many names do the three of them have? There are three persons but one name, in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. That shows oneness, but it also shows what? Three. Three in one. Continue saying, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 14, another verse that refers to three. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 14, it's the benediction, the apostolic benediction that the Apostle Paul gives to conclude the letters to the Corinthians. It says there, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's number one, and the love of God, there's number two, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, amen. Once again the idea of three, time and again in the Old Testament and in the New Testament you have this idea that you have one God but you have three persons. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 12 in verses 4 through 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses 4 through 6. It says, There are diversity of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are diversities of ministries, the same what? 
Come on, you can help me. The same Lord. And then it says, there are diversities of what? Yes, but there is one what? There is one God. Do you notice there? Three, you have the Spirit, you have the Lord, and you have who? And you have God. Once again, three are participating in the impartation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now let's 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. Peter also has this concept, this idea. It says there, Peter, and actually I'm going to read starting at verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, there you have one, in the sanctification of the Spirit, there you have two, for obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, there's three, grace to you, and peace be multiplied. Now let's go to Revelation, Revelation chapter 1 and verses 4 and 5, Revelation chapter 1 and verses 4 and 5. It says there, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you, and now notice, and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, there you have one, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, the number seven is symbolic of completeness or totality, the fullness of the Spirit, and then it says, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. Once again you have him who is and who was and who is to come, you have the seven spirits, and you have Jesus Christ. Three. Notice Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 18. I want to read a few more because I want you to see how pervasive this idea is in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 18 once again has three. It says, for through Him, that is Jesus, we both have access by one Spirit, there's number two, to whom? To the Father, there's number three. Notice also John chapter 1 and verses 1 to 3, and this passage only mentions two, but it still proves the point that the God is, is composed of more than one. It says in John 1 verses 1 through 3, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now isn't that interesting? You have one who is with God, so he's not the same person as God there, he's with God, he's with someone who's called God, but it also says that he is what? God. So how many persons do you have in that verse? Who are God? Two, very clearly. Verse 2, he was in the beginning with God, there you have it again. All things were made through him. By the way that expression, all things were made through him, means that there is someone who is making the things through him. There has to be someone, someone who is using him as the instrument through whom things are made. So it says all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. Notice John chapter 6 and verse 46. John chapter 6 and verse 46. It says here, not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God, he has seen the Father. Now is this insinuating that Jesus has seen the Father? Of course. Now if Jesus and the Father are the same person, then Jesus probably was looking in the mirror. We know that that's not the case. He was with the Father, He saw the Father, they are two separate individuals. Notice 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. This is a very well known verse. It's speaking about Jesus as our advocate or intercessor. My little children, these things I write to you, so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So if Jesus and the Father are the same person, then Jesus is interceding with Himself. We know that that's not the case. If He is the advocate with the Father, He is one, and the Father obviously is another. Notice also Romans 8 verse 34, one more verse where we have a plurality of persons within the Godhead. Romans 8 and verse 34. 
Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also writ risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. You know, if he's at the right hand of God, he has to be a separate individual from God the Father. Furthermore, if he's interceding, he has to be interceding before someone. That means that there are at least two persons in this verse that refer to the Godhead. And so the conclusion is inevitable. The Bible is clear that God is one. Very, very clear. Many verses, Old Testament and New Testament, underline the fact that God is one. But equally true are all of those texts where God is spoken of as more than one. In some verses, two, Jesus and His Father. And in many verses, three, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now the big question is this, how do we reconcile those two ideas? How is it possible for God to be one, and yet for God to be three? You know in math, as I was mentioning, it's impossible for three to be equal to one. That is logical nonsense. And yet sometimes when we think theologically, logic does not apply. So in what sense is God one, and in what sense is God three? Let's read some verses that reconcile these two ideas. You see the Trinity is not that difficult to understand when we understand what the word one means. Go with me once again to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Hear O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. By the way that word one that is used there is the Hebrew word echad. It doesn't mean, mean one numerically, but it means one in terms of unity. Not one numerically, but one in unity. I'm going to show you that from other texts in Scripture. In other words, you can have three, but they're one in the sense that they are perfectly united. Notice Genesis 2 verse 24. Here the same word is used. It's not referring to God, but it's referring to man. It helps us, however, understand in what sense God is one. Genesis 2 verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and they shall become what? One flesh. By the way, does this mean that, uh, that the man jumps into the woman, or the woman jumps into the man, and they become one person? Obviously not. What does the word one mean here? It does not mean one numerically, it means one in terms of unity. They are perfectly two united in one, because they're supposed to think in a similar way. They're supposed to be in harmony, they're supposed to be in accord. In other words, numerically they are obviously two, but in terms of unity they are one. So let me ask you, in this verse is it possible for two to be one? Of course. So if it's possible for two to be one, why can't three be one? Now let's notice what Jesus had to say, he was even more explicit about this uh, marriage in the New Testament. Matthew 19 and verses 4 through 6. Matthew 19 and verses 4 through 6. And he answered and said to them, Jesus is speaking to the Jewish leaders, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Notice the two shall become one flesh. And now Jesus is really strong on this. He says, so then they are no longer two. Now I see some of you who are husband and wife here, and unless I'm seen double, I see two. But Jesus says they're no longer two. They're one. He's explicit. Therefore what God hath joined together, do you see the idea of unity there? What God has joined together, let not man separate. So husband and wife are two, but Jesus says they're no longer two, they are what? One. So two equals one in theology, not in math. Genesis 11 verses 6 and 7. Genesis 11 verses 6 and 7. 
once again this is speaking about the Tower of Babel and there were thousands of people probably who were rebuilding this tower it says and the Lord said indeed the people are one so they all jumped into one body right? by the way the word here is echad the same word of Genesis 2 verse 24 the people are one what is uh, Moses trying to tell us when he, when he tells us that the Lord said that the people were one? one person? no they were perfectly what? united and the Lord said indeed the people are one and they all have one language and this is what they begin to do now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them come let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech so once again all of those thousands of builders of the Tower of Babel were told by Moses who is quoting God that all those people were how many? one they were not one numerically they were one in sense in the sense of unity notice Galatians 3 verse 28 let's examine a few texts from the New Testament that use the word one Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28 it says here there is neither Jew nor Greek there is neither slave nor free there is neither male nor female for you are all one in Christ Jesus what are we? we are all what? one, well I see a good number of people here today you don't all look like one, I must not only be seeing double I must be seeing multiple people here the fact is what is meant by the Apostle Paul when he says that we are all one in Christ Jesus he's not speaking numerically he's speaking theologically we are all one in the sense of being what? united notice also 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 20 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 20 but now indeed there are many members yet what? yet one body many members one body in the same way husband and wife are two but they're one the builders of the Tower of Babel were many but they were one when we join Jesus Christ we are one we are one not numerically we are one in terms of unity are you understanding how three can be equal to one? when the Bible says that God is one it's speaking about unity when the Bible says there are three it's speaking about three persons in that unity it's not polytheism that we're dealing with here because it is possible for three to be equal to one when you understand one in the biblical sense of the word notice John 17 and verses 10 and 11 and we'll also read verses 20 and 21 John 17 verses 10 and 11 and then we'll go to verses 20 and 21 this is the great prayer of Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane before he went to the cross he says and all mine are yours and yours are mine and I am glorified in them now I am no longer in the world but these are in the world and I come to you Holy Father keep through your name those whom you have given me notice that they may be one as we are one verse 20 I do not pray for these alone but also for those who will believe it through their word that they all may be what? one as you Father are in me and I in you that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that you sent me Jesus is praying for his eleven disciples because Judas was going to apostatize did Jesus pray that all of his eleven disciples should be one? did he want them all to be one? yes does that mean that they were no longer uh, you didn't have Peter and John and Andrew they all jumped into one person? of course not what was Jesus praying for? he was praying for them to be what? to be in unity to be united all in one accord like it happened on the day of Pentecost they were all of one accord in one place according to the scripture by the way did you notice that Jesus wanted us all to be one even as he and his father were one? so if eleven people can be one can also God the Father and his son be two and yet be one? obviously yes because it's speaking about unity it is not speaking about numbers by the way we sing the little chorus we are one in the spirit we are one in the Lord that doesn't mean that we're one numerically it means that we're one in terms of uh, the theological meaning of scripture now notice John 14 verses 10 and 11 John 14 and verses 10 and 11 
Once again the emphasis of the unity between Jesus and His Father. It says there, do you not believe that I, that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Notice he's speaking about the unity with his Father. My Father tells me what to do, my Father tells me what to say, I am in such unity with him that we work in harmony. Verse 11, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Once again the idea of unity, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. John 14 verse 20, a, a few verses uh, farther down in chapter 14. At that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Now what is Jesus saying? I in the Father, the Father in me, I in you, you in me. He's saying that there's supposed to be a perfect triangle here between the Father, the Son, and us. We're supposed to be in perfect unity. In other words, the oneness is a oneness of unity. This is the reason why I believe that instead of speaking of the doctrine of the tree, we should talk of the doctrine of the triunity of God. Because they are three persons that are in perfect unity. They are one God in thought, in power, in character, in work, in objectives, in purpose, in plans but they are not one person. In other words we could say that they are distinguishable but they are not separable. They are three of the same kind. You know in my household there are four Bohrs. We all have the same last name, Bohr. Well in God's family there are three and they're all called God. Their name is God. Three in one. Now throughout the course of the history of the church several imperfect analogies have been given for the Trinity. For example some people say that the Trinity is like a tree. You know a tree has a root, it has branches, and it has fruit. But it's just one tree. The problem with that is the fruit is only part of a tree. And the branches are only a part and the root is only a part. With, with the Trinity they are all completely God in themselves. They're not a part of God. They are totally God within themselves. Other people say, you know, it's kind of like an egg. It has a shell, a yolk, and the white part. Well, once again, the problem is, you know, that would mean that each one of them is only a part of God. When the Bible teaches that each one of them is God in their fullness. Others say, you know, they're like the sun. The sun has light, heat, and brightness. Once again, that's not a good analogy because each one of these things is only a part of what the sun produces. Other people say, you know, it's like man. Man is body, soul, and spirit, according to Scripture. Well, the thing is, the spirit is only part of man, and the body is only a part of man, and the soul is only a part of man. And so, uh, to speak of the Godhead in terms of body, soul, and spirit would mean that each person is only a part of God, and not God in its fullness. Now allow me to read you some very interesting statements that we find in the writings of Ellen White on the Trinity. I'm going to go quickly through these, they are really striking statements. The first one is found in Review and Herald, August 15, 1907. She's speaking about Hebrews 1 verses 1 and 2 and she says this, Here the position of Jesus Christ in reference to His Father is brought to view. While they are one in purpose and one in mind, yet in personality they are two. May we not learn from this that there is to be unity between believers? Do you see what she's saying? They are two distinct personalities, but they're in unity. She says, can't we learn something from that and have unity even though we are many? In another statement that we find in Ministry of Healing, page 421 and 422, she says this, the scriptures clearly indicate the relation between God and Christ, and they bring to view as clearly the personality and individuality of each. Notice Jesus and the Father have personality and individuality. By the way I looked up the definition of individuality in the World Book Dictionary, and this is the definition, the character or qualities which distinguish one person or thing from another. So when Ellen White says that the scriptures clearly indicate the relation between God and Christ and they bring to view as clearly the personality and individuality of each, it means that each one is an individual in himself. 
She continues saying, the personality of the Father and the Son, also the, un the unity that exists between them, are presented in the 17th chapter of John, in the prayer of Christ for His disciples. The unity that exists between Christ and His disciples, does not destroy the personality of either. Are you catching what she's saying? The unity between Christ and His disciples does not destroy the personality. There's still eleven disciples, plus the one that was named on the day of Pentecost, and Christ. She continues saying, the unity that exists between Christ and His disciples does not destroy the personality of either. They are one in purpose, in mind, in character, but not in person. It is thus that God and Christ are one. Notice this statement uh, that Ellen White presented in 1897. She says, the prince of the power of evil can only be held in check by the power of God in the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. The reason I read this one is because there are many Adventists these days that are saying that the Holy Spirit is just an influence or a force, that He's not a person. Ellen White makes it clear that not only are the Father and the Son persons, she makes it very clear that the Holy Spirit is a person, as does the Bible as well. Once again she says, the prince of the power of evil can only be held in check by the power of God in the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. So is the Holy, is the Holy Spirit a person? He's the third person. Notice in 1898, Ellen White has this to say, Desire of Ages, page 671. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead. Third person of the Godhead, who would come with no modified energy, but in the fullness of divine power. Notice that the Holy Spirit is not only a person, He has the fullness of divine power. It is the Spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's Redeemer. In 1899 Ellen White said this, Evangelism, page 616, We need to realize that the Holy Spirit, who is as much a person as God is a person, is walking through these grounds. He's talking about Avondale College. She's talking about Avondale College here. So she says that the Holy Spirit is as much a person as God is a person. In 1906 she had this to say about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is a person, for He beareth witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. When this witness is born it carries with it its own evidence. At such times we believe and are sure that we are the children of God. Then she says this, the Holy Spirit has a personality. So if anybody tells you the Holy Spirit is just a force, and you know Jesus is inferior to the Father, He's not fully God, we need to shut the door to that. She says the Holy Spirit has a personality, or else He could not bear witness to our spirits, and with our spirits, that we are the children of God. He must also be a divine person. In other words, He's not only a person, but He's a divine person. He is God or else he could not search out the secrets which, he, which lie hidden in the mind of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. One final statement, Evangelism page 615, Ellen White speaks about the heavenly trio. She realized that there were three in the Trinity, three in the Godhead. She says this, there are three living persons of the heavenly trio. I like that. Three living persons of the heavenly trio. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Those who receive Christ by living faith are baptized, and these powers will cooperate with the obedient subjects of heaven in their efforts to live the new life in Christ. Three living persons in the heavenly trio. Now somebody's probably saying, well Pastor Bohr, what difference does it make whether you believe in the Trinity or not? You know, it's okay if you believe that God is just one person. Let me in closing share with you the reason why it's important to recognize that God is a Trinity. We're going to notice in our next study that the Godhead works in perfect harmony, but each one of the persons of the Godhead have their particular function. 
And we're going to find also in our next study that there are other beings in heaven that help the Godhead. You have the cherubim, the seraphim, the heavenly host, the heavenly angels, and the inhabitants of the worlds. We're going to discuss all of these things in succeeding lectures in this series. Now why is the doctrine of the Trinity important? First of all, it's comforting to know that we, not have only, we don't have only one almighty power working in our behalf. We not only have two, but we have three that are working with the utmost of power to gain the victory in the lives of God's people in this world. Furthermore, and this is even more serious, the Bible explains that the essence of God is love. But in order for love to exist, there has to be a giver and a receiver. Is that true? In order to love there has to be someone to love? Now what would, what would happen if God at some point was only one person? The big question is who would God have loved? Love cannot exist with only one person unless you speak about self-love and self-love is the essence of sin. And so the Trinity safeguards the certainty of love in the universe before anything in this universe existed. Now there are some questions about the Trinity that I could never answer. For example, where did they come from? That's a mystery. I can't answer that. Another question. Where did they get their powers from? Don't ask me. I don't have any idea. What were they doing, doing before they created anything in the universe? There must have been some time when they were there and there was nothing. What were they doing? I don't know. But we have enough information to know that there are three. They work for our good. They guarantee love. And someday we will be able to inhabit eternity, or eternally with them.